Good afternoon. Man, it's good to be here. I am so glad to see you people and worship with you people. So happy to be here. It's been a busy couple of months for me. That's good. That's good. A lot of people are hearing the gospel. A lot of people are getting married. Yeah. Um, I'm just glad to see God working and changing lives and challenging people. Ah, happy, happy to be here with you today. I, uh, I got a new computer, but I forgot to order a cable to do slide show, so you don't get a uh, slide show today, just, just God's Word, that's all, yeah. Well, this morning at uh, 4.30 in the morning, I called my mother. So, happy Mother's Day, everybody, who's a mother out there. Hey, happy Mother's Day, woman. We appreciate you. I called my mom. I think she's 76 or 77. We don't know. She won't show us her driver's license. We don't know. I think somewhere around there. But uh, maybe add two or three years to that, probably. And uh, we had a good talk, and she talked about gardening and uh, wrinkles and losing weight. And I mean, she's five foot one, maybe. And weighs about 100 pounds, and she thinks she's six foot one and weighs 200 pounds. She's a tough little southern girl. Um, my mom's not uh, born again yet. She's not quite there. We just keep trusting God that she'll come, but uh, she's fine, fine mother. She's a masterful cook. And every time we go back, she cooks something wonderful, and Midori says, Can you show me how to do that? And she says, I don't know. I just stand up in front of these pots and slave my uh, slave uh, my body parts off and and it just comes out and you guys are happy I don't know I can't teach people to do it she's a wonderful cook and uh, she just loves my wife and my kids and my little brother my younger brother was there today Saturday in, in Louisiana and uh, he had been working in the yard my mom has a big yard and she used to garden, grow flowers and vegetables and stuff. And now she doesn't do that. So my little brother's Mother's Day gift to her was to go and pull stumps and uh, plant a few things and get eaten by mosquitoes. So uh, she and I talked for a long time. And then my little brother and I talked, with, and she could hear our conversation. And uh, my little brother and I talked about my favorite, our favorite saying of our mother when... He was in elementary school and I was in junior high school. We lived in an old farmhouse and they had large pecan trees, pecan trees for some of you people, pecan trees, like uh, like kudumi, like a walnut. But uh, we had three large pecan trees and they were the best trees for climbing when mom's not around. And every time mom would catch us, she would run out and say the same thing all the time, every time. If you fall out of that tree and break your leg, don't come running to me. And I'm going, my little brother and I were just dying on the phone this morning. Yeah. <laughs> she used to say that all the time. Yeah. And then she used to say, do your homework. I don't want any idiot kids. Do your homework. And I'd say, Mom, I'm, I did all my homework at study hall today. Don't get smart with me. So wait a minute. You want me to get smart, but you don't want me to get smart. So we, were, we had a good time. We had a good time. She's a, she's a wonderful lady, and we just want her to get saved and uh, just improve on that wonderfulness. So if you haven't called your mom yet, shame on you. No, please call her when you get a chance. She'll appreciate it. And I need to call my mother often. You remember, you remember that guy who works for Ford named Bob, right? Bob. Bob calls his mom every day. Every day. Calls his mom. Nice guy. I try once a month. And it's, it's a... All right. Today we're going to look at a really godly mom from the Bible. One of my favorite stories from the Old Testament is about Hannah. 1 Samuel chapter 1. We're going to read all of chapter 1 and part of chapter 2. So if you would like to turn with me... 
to 1 Samuel chapter 1. And we're going to read all of that. But before we read, I'd like to pray. So while you find that, I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all of our mothers, for all the mothers in the world. What a great blessing mothers are, Lord. Today, Lord, I pray that we can learn special lessons from this godly mother, Hannah, from your word. Open up our hearts and our minds to receive your word and be changed to glorify you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Everybody there? There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zuphite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah, and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. When the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival, Penina, kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? I know what you ladies are thinking right now. Just hold it. Verse 9. Once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow, saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk. And he said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Actually says get rid of your beer and wine and you know all kinds of alcohol, but just get stop it. <clears throat> Verse fifteen, not so, my lord. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my heart and my soul to the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Verse 19. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah lay with his wife Hannah, with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. Verse 21. When the man Elkanah went up with his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord, 
and to fill, fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, Elkanah, her husband told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah, a flower, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli. And she said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you, praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. Then and there they worshipped God. And then turn with me to chapter 2. Just right there, continue. We're going to read the first 11 verses. Then Hannah said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is none, I'm sorry, there is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly, or let your, your mouth speak with arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the wa warriors are broken but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry hunger no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who, is, who has had many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. Upon them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked will be silenced in darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder against them from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth, he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went, to, went home to Ramah, but the boy, Samuel, ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. Oh, wow, long text, huh? Great story. Great story. Well, if we... Uh, oh, thank you. Yes, I'll take some more. If we look at uh, the order of the books in uh, the English Bible, the Japanese Bible too, we will see that 1 Samuel follows the book of Ruth. But in the Hebrew Bible, 1 Samuel follows the book of Judges. And the last verse in the book of Judges says that everybody in Israel was doing everything they wanted, and there was no leader, basically. Israel was a mess. No leadership, and everybody did what they wanted, behaved as they wanted. That was the state of things in Israel at the time of this story. Yet, Elkanah, Elkanah, the husband of Hannah, was a, a godly man. He was careful to... Go to the feast every year and do his worship practices every year. He was going up to Shiloh year after year after year. He did this. He was faithful to do that. And we might ask, well, why did he have two wives? The Bible standard is the same. The Bible proclaims that some of the patriarchs had more than one wife. The Bible never condones it. The Bible never says it's okay Bible never says, do it. However, we find that it happened. 
And some of these patriarchs were still godly people in every other aspect but that one. And so, you know, we wonder, how does God bless these people? I don't know. I know what God's punishment is, though, for having more than one wife. It's have, having two mother-in-laws. You know, I mean, it's easy. Sorry. I'm, but, I mean, why would somebody want to do that? We, we just can't understand that. And why can God bless and encourage? And It's, it's a difficult issue. And, again, the Bible standard is one husband, one wife. Right? That's just, just the way it is. You know, multiple wives... This is not acceptable, but in this case, Helkanah had two wives. Just straight out reports it. And one thing we can find that is persistent in the Old Testament when somebody has more than one wife, trouble always follows that pattern. They are always in trouble. They're always going, oh, what did I do? You know? And here his heart is, you know, divided here. We might understand when we think about in this day and age, what was the purpose of having a wife anyway? Was to have children. That was the main purpose of a wife. They had other duties, I'm sure, that they did. But women in those days were to reproduce. And when a woman couldn't reproduce, it was like a curse. And it was terrible. It was just... Everybody was wondering, okay, what did she do? Why is she cursed? And in this case, probably Hannah was Elkanah's first wife. And she didn't have any children. And so he married this other person, Penina, and she had children. She had children. Penina had several children. But Hannah had none. Doesn't excuse it. He would have been smart to stay with Hannah anyway, but he had Penina, and they had problems. Year after year, Elkanah went up to Shiloh to sacrifice before the Lord. There was a famous temple where the head priest was Eli. If we continue to read chapter 2, Beyond verse 11, we'll find out that Eli's sons were very, very bad. And in verse 3 of chapter 1, we can read that it announces that, you know, Eli was the chief priest, but his, his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests also there. He was the chief priest because of the place where he sat at the shrine, at the temple there. So they would go to the shrine and, and they would sacrifice an animal and... A great portion of the animal was for the priests and their families. And then he, he got to keep some and share it with his family. And he would give a portion, the allotted portion, he would give to his wife, uh, Penina. And he would give her, their, her and her children a normal portion. But he loved Hannah so much, he would give her double that. Just so much. And it would show in front of everybody how much, it was obvious to everybody that he loved Hannah more. And so, Penina was, you know, we're up there at this feast, and, yeah, you should get all that meat, but I've got kids. You don't have any. It was just terrible. It was just terrible. The, the thing that we have to really be careful here is asking, you know, what in the world? Was it a health condition? Why was this poor woman unable to have children? What does this say? Really hard to, to grasp, right? The Lord closed Hannah's womb. What is that? Why would God do such a thing? And it repeats it again in the next verse. Verse 5 says, But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, a rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. The original Hebrew says, Penina's provoking of Hannah, the, the word is provoking here, caused her thunder. I'm one of the weird ones who like thunder. 
right? But most people, when, you know, thunder shakes your house in the summer and a thunderstorm, you just run and hide somewhere. That's how bad it was for Hannah to hear Penina just irritating her. Now, why didn't her husband, Elkanah, stand up and protect her? I don't know. But this guy is like most husbands when they see their spouse suffering, they want to say and do something, <laughs> but too often we say the wrong thing. We do the wrong thing. And I think this is one of those cases. Verse 8, Elkanah says, Hannah, why are you weeping? Don't you know? Is what I want to ask. <laughs> why don't you eat? Don't you know? This woman is irritating her to death. Why are you downhearted? Why are you depressed? And then, then he really says the stupidest thing a man could say, I think. Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Can you see him holding out his fingers like this? Can you hear Hannah really start crying then? Ah, you don't understand me. And he doesn't. He doesn't. He's trying, but he doesn't. Let me tell you, one of the characteristics, and we're going to talk about some characteristics of a godly mother and a godly woman, is that godly women have real life problems. Godly women have real life problems. If you decide to live for God, you're going to face things that you never faced before. You're going to have issues that you've never dealt with before. Becoming a Christian, following hard after God, just because you're a young godly mother, a godly woman, just because you're living for God, doesn't exempt you from problems. Sometimes the opposite is true. The minute you get saved, things go south. Do you know that expression? Huh? Things go south. Things get really bad. I mean, well, I mean, here's some of the reasons. The, uh, the devil doesn't like you once you get saved. Satan just does not like you. He wants to get in your way. He wants to cause you problems. He wants peninas to aggravate you to death. Now, I'm not saying that Satan caused Hannah to not be able to conceive and have a children because this Bible says that God closed her womb. But the irritation that came from this other wife could have been devil-oriented. It could be. I don't know. But she provoked her so much that the lady actually has depression, I think, you know, just very symptomatic of depression. Another thing, that once you get saved, society doesn't like what you're doing and saying. So you're standing against the world that thinks one thing, and your mindset says, I'm going to live for God, and I'm going to live holy, and I'm going to live a positive life, and I'm going to help others, and not just think about me, and the world's going, what is wrong with you? And so you're standing against a society that's selfish and you're trying to be a giving, loving person. So you're going to have some real life problems when you're a godly woman, a godly mom, trying to do the right things. Things are going to get bad for you sometimes. And you know what? When I, when I first got saved, I, you know, I had some Christian friends from all over America. And uh, one of my friends was a real southern guy and he used to say to me Kevin you got to start believing the Bible because every promise in the book is yours and I was going yeah, all right you know and I'd find promises and I'd stand on them and you know well I didn't take the promises I didn't like I took the promises that I thought were just good do you know Jesus gave us a lot of promises and Jesus said it if it, Jesus promised it it should be true right we should believe it right you want to turn with me to John chapter 16, verse 33? 
It's best to read the whole chapter, but we're just going to go to that one verse. <clears throat> if you want to live a godly life, one thing, one characteristic of a godly woman, godly mother, godly man for that matter, is that you will have real life problems. You will not be able to deliver, you will not be able to get pregnant sometimes. You will be sick sometimes. You will have financial Things come and bother you at times. John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Okay, you can have peace. That's a promise. What's he say in the next portion of that verse? In the same breath, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. One more time. I didn't get any amens from that. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. There's going to be things that we will face. We will have heartaches. We will have friends who have problems. We will have children who will have problems. And guess what? Once we pray and pray through a problem and we get victory over an issue, guess what's waiting around the next corner? Yeah, trouble. Trouble is waiting for the believer who's trying to live a godly life. It's going to happen. Let's go to another characteristic. Hannah was a woman who was so sad and so beat up, so misunderstood by her husband. He was trying. I believe he was trying. And she was just so broken hearted. But the second characteristic of a godly woman is one who prays with passion and persistence. Godly women pray with passion and they pray persistently. Verse 9 says, when, Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. She just couldn't take it anymore. She didn't want to be around there anymore. She just had to get out of there. So did she have to be in a perfect mood to go and pray? No. She was just a mess. And she went to the temple, and Eli the priest was sitting in his ceremonial chair representing the, the chief priest's position by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. And verse 10 says, In delight of soul? No, in bitterness of soul. This woman was hurting. She was in a lot of pain. Maybe something us guys can never understand. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. There's just something special about mixing our prayers with tears. From the very depths of our pain, when we cry out to God in Romans chapter 8, as a Pentecostal man, I believe that there's a point when we can't pray any longer words. And the Holy Spirit takes over and begins to utter something out of this world. I am filled with God's Spirit and He prays for me. Because of the joy in my heart, or because of this bitterness, this pain, or because of a longing to see someone saved, Hannah was there. There was nothing else she desired. She had this man who loved her so much, Yet she couldn't serve her purpose in this life. She wanted to have a child. As a young Jewish woman, having a child was the perfect thing. That's what her duty was before her husband and before her God. To have a son. To raise in a godly way. But she couldn't do it. In bitterness of soul, she began to weep so much. And she prayed to the Lord, and she made a vow to the Lord, saying, Oh, Lord Almighty, if only you will give me a son. 
Just look upon my misery, God. Can't you see I'm in pain? Remember me. Don't forget me. Give me a son. If you do, I'll give him back to you. Not just for the moment, but for all the days of his life. I'll bring him right back here and let him serve you. Was she bargaining with God? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think she was just saying, God, this is what I want to do. Just, you know, just take this curse away from me or just let me have a son. Just there was so much pain that the words came out and she said, you know, give me a son, God. Please just do something for me. She played with passion. It was not just a simple little, okay, God, I'm about to leave now. Protect me as I, I'm on my way to Mitaki. Bye. Where's my Starbucks? You know, nothing like that. It wasn't a shallow, spur of the moment little thing. I mean, this was this woman pouring out her being before God. And God saw it. God knew it wasn't a shallow, spur of the moment prayer. She was passionate. She kept on praying. She kept on praying to the Lord. Don't overlook verse 12. She kept on praying, but she was out of words. No more words. No more energy to even make a word. But her lips were moving. And the priest is looking at her saying, Man, what is it? you got another drunk over here. Now, why would he say that? Because I told you in Judges, the end of Judges, there was no leaders in Israel... And the people were doing what they wanted. There was no, lo- no law. Nobody following the law. It was just a time of drunkenness and uh, people doing whatever they wanted, living whatever kind of lifestyle there was. So Eli was probably used to seeing a bunch of drunk women around the temple. And he's seeing this one, you know, who's really drunk and laying there and she's, you know, mouthing something because she's under the influence of too much alcohol. But this was not Hannah's case. Hannah was there. And she's pouring out her heart before God. And her lips are moving, but no sound's coming out. And another guy who misunderstands her says, How long are you going to keep getting drunk, woman? Put away your wine. She doesn't let Eli get away with that. Imagine that, a woman who answers back. Sorry, ducking. How long will you keep getting drunk? What a thing to say to somebody who's coming to your temple to pray. Maybe some sign of the times. Not so, my Lord. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking anything. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Don't misunderstand me. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. There are no more words for Hannah to explain how she feels. Anguish, grief, great pain, (laughs) deeply troubled. And Eli gives her a benediction. Eli said something that changed Hannah's whole view. One little word of encouragement And Hannah was just changed. All he said was, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of Him. Wow, finally, a guy said something right. And Hannah took that as God's promise, and she wouldn't let it go. Okay, I'm going to go in peace, and I'm going to wait for God to give me. I'm taking this man of God at His word. And I'm going. I'm going. In verse 18 she said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. And you know what the original language actually says? Hannah probably asked him to pray for her, is what the original Hebrew indicates. So when she says, May I find favor in your eyes, and will you pray for me? You could add that in there in the Hebrew. And it wouldn't be strange at all. Some versions actually say that. Pray for me, Eli. I don't know if he did. I hope he did. Look at the change. Then she went away and she ate. She wasn't eating. And her face was no longer downcast. Just persistent, passionate prayer. 
And God responds through this priest and says, Be at peace, daughter. And God's going to grant you what you've asked for. She took it. She took it. She believed it. So this godly woman had trouble in her life, but she prayed passionately and she prayed persistently. And then, verse 19 and 20, early the next morning, they arose and worshipped before the Lord before they went back to the home. So the procedure was there. You know, they would slaughter these animals. They'd get some of it. And they'd have a feast. And it was quite a long process. And then the last day came um, before they went back to their home. Elkanah lay with, his wife, with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. The Lord opened up her womb. In the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord from him. Now the Hebrew word Samuel sounds like heard from God. El is the particle, the word that is the introduction or the front part of the word for God, Elohim. So Samuel heard from God. So she named him that. Why? Right? So she could always remember every time she called his name, I heard from God. I heard from God. God said, go in peace and I'm going to give you what you ask for because you're passionate and persistent in your prayer. That's not, you know, we hear this in the New Testament, the persistent in prayer thing, right? Jesus told a story about a, an unjust judge who, you know, this widow kept coming to him, give me justice, give me justice, go away lady, I'm busy. I don't want to hear it. And she just came, I want justice, I'm not going to give up until I get it. And finally the unjust judge said, okay. If you just leave me alone, I'll give you. I'll take care of you. And Jesus said, isn't God the Father better than this unjust judge? If you come to him persistently, he'll, he'll give you what you need. And that's the story here. Godly women, the third point, godly women experience God's provision. God remembered Hannah. He provided for her a son. He didn't forget her. Now, you might say, well, you know, how did this work? I mean, I know a lot of people who, you know, want children, they can't have them. How does that work? And sometimes I pray and God doesn't provide all of what I ask for. This is not a story about, when I say that God, godly women, you know, experience God's provision, we have to pray godly prayers. And we have to pray in accordance with God's will, of course. And God will provide everything that, a, that we need according to his will. In the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. His name was Samuel. God needed a very special prophet in the next few years. And along came Samuel, a godly prophet. God had plans for Samuel. God opened up Hannah's womb. She conceived. And her prayer in the past where she was just pouring out her heart before God worked in accordance with God's will, and Hannah experienced God's provision. Women of God, if you are praying in accordance to God's will, if you're living a life in accordance to God's will, He will provide for you beyond any shadow of a doubt. He might not provide what you think you need, when you think you need it, but He will be right on time providing you everything you need. Amen? Godly, godly women experience God's provision without a doubt. Man, the timing thing is so hard. I was talking with someone recently who said, when will I ever be able to get this thing, this goal that I'm reaching out for? You know, I, I take one step forward and two steps backwards sometimes. I thought this is what God wanted. I followed His plan. And then, you know, I'm just, I don't know. Four or five years down the road, they look back and go, Wow, I can see how God worked this all out. I thought I had made a mistake, but God closed the door because He didn't want me to go here. He had better things over this way. But what do we do? What do we do? I'd like to just go back to the persistence in prayer thing one more time. 
if you are praying for someone in your family who is not a believer yet, if you're praying for them to get saved, pray with passion. Pray persistently. Go to God day and night. Go to God over and over. Go to God until you can't pray anymore. There are more, no more words to express your passion before God. Tell Him what you want from the very depth of your being. You have a financial crisis in your life. Go to God with passion and persistence. See if God won't be faithful to meet your needs. You will experience God's provision. My next point, godly women keep their vows. They keep their promises. They stick with what they've told God they're going to do. Did Hannah and God have a bargain? Was God worried about her into the bargain? All God wanted her to do was live a right life. She didn't, God said, okay, now I gave you that son, now keep up your end of the deal. It's not like that at all, right? It doesn't work like that. But Hannah did say to God, give me a son, I'll bring him back to serve in this temple, not for the moment, but for all of his life. He'll be a Nazarite. He won't, you know, no razor will ever cut his hair. Just grow his hair long. Samson was a, an example of that in the Bible. He was under that order. And that's what she said she would do. Now, very interesting, verses 21 through 28, where this part of the story comes from. Elkanah is getting smart, isn't he? Hannah has a child that she's been waiting for. And, and it's time for them to go up to the to do the annual sacrifice to the Lord and fulfill his vow and he was faithful to do that and Hannah didn't go we don't hear that Elkanah said oh come on we're all going let's go it's a big family thing nothing like that she said to her husband after the boy is weaned I will take him and present him to the Lord and he will live there always and verse 23 smart response do what seems best to you good man Good man, you're learning. Sometimes I ask the young uh, couples when they come to me for premarital counseling, I ask them, how's the preparation going? And they go, oh, man, it's driving us crazy. It's terrible. So busy. And I said, you guys fighting? And they go, man, we fight every day. Most, that's the, most, the best response I get. Shochu kengashimasu. That's what they say. Almost every day. All, every moment. And I asked the, the groom, I say, are you losing? And he goes, uh, I said, are you losing? He goes, yeah, I'm losing. All right, good man. Keep it up, you'll be all right. You're losing the battle. <laughs> Elkanah said to Hannah, do what seems best to you. Did they discuss this? Did uh, Hannah say, look, you know, God gave me this child and I promised? Probably they discussed this. And he didn't argue with her. He said, okay, stay here until you've weaned him. Only the Lord will, you know, may the Lord help you out. You know, let's, let's see God work this through. So Hannah stayed home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. So he was probably about three years old. About three years old. That was the tradition. They would wean them at about three. Uh, they, don't, they get to be about three and nothing else from mom, all right? Time to eat solid foods. Okay. After he was weaned, verse 24, she took the boy with her. Young as he was, God put that in there for a point. God knows what he's saying and knows what he's doing here. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, about three, year, three years old, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephra flower, a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said, Hey, I'm that lady who you thought was drunk. That's me. Believe it or not, it's me. And here, here is my son. I prayed for him. God gave him to me just as you said. And the words are so, so good. The Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give Samuel to the Lord for his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And he was, you can read Samuel's story, 
in this book. And look at this. Look at verse 28. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Who is he? Who is this pronoun talking about? Eli? No. Some other servant that they brought along? No. And Samuel worshipped the Lord there. He's three years old. He's three years old. Look what follows there. Then and there they worshipped the Lord. Right then and there. This three-year-old boy is worshipping the Lord with Eli, with Hannah, with the whole temple court, except maybe the two sons of uh, Eli who were out doing strange things. Samuel is three years old and he's worshipping already. Why is he doing this? Because of his godly mother. That's why. She taught him what it meant to pray and worship and to keep a vow. That's why Samuel is three years old and he's worshipping and he continued to worship all his life. John Wesley and Charles Wesley had a godly mother who spent one hour a day with them every day of their young childhood teaching them Bible stories. And they became pastors and missionaries who changed Europe and changed the world and gave us the... God used them to uh, cause the Wesleyan movement and the great revival that swept across Europe and eventually into America. You can never, ever under... We should never, ever underestimate the power of a praying, worshiping, loving mother. Samuel worshipped the Lord there, and he stayed there because his mother, Hannah, kept her vows. Her vow wasn't just to... I, I'm guilty. You know, I, I say, God, you know, here I am. I got this need, you know, provide for us. Uh, maybe it's a kind of bargain. You know, but, you know, I need this and then, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change some things in my life. And as soon as God gives me that thing, it's over. I'm done. What, what vow? Huh? Did I promise God I, if you then... That's not Hannah at all. Look. Look at what Hannah did. Think about this. You can ask any mom in here who's raised children. And the best part is raising them from that little time till they're adults, right? Hannah's not going to see any of that. She's giving up the best years of her children's childhood she could be raising this child and seeing him grow and change. She's just saying, God, he's yours. Right now. I'm keeping my vow. You gave me a son, I'm giving him back. Godly women keep their vows. Godly women keep their vows. And then, my last point. Godly women know how to praise God. Amen? Godly women know how to praise God. I can remember... I can remember as a young believer being in some charismatic or Pentecostal church, just, you know, and everybody's praying and lifting their hands, and I was going, wow, man, look at that. And I could see young mothers, not so young mothers, pouring their tears out, just worshiping God and singing worship to God and praying the greatest words praising and praying all at the same time and ha that having such a powerful impact on me. I remember Nozomu, our own Nozomu, telling how he would come home sometime drunk, been away from God, away from his family, seeing his mother, hearing his mother pray and cry, worship God and pray for him and worship God some more. And he thought, why doesn't she just give up? <laughs> Stop it! And she wouldn't. And Hannah, you'd think that she was downhearted after she gave this son, her only son that we know of, to the Lord. 
son she had prayed for year after year after year. Son she had begged for. Now she gave him over to the ministry. Be no more daily contact with him. And there she is, praising God. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Godly women know how to praise God. Hannah knew how to praise God. Hannah prayed and said, she didn't say anything about Samuel. How, what a wonderful child you've given me. What a great priest. I know he's going to become a great priest. He's a godly boy. He already knows how to worship. He prays. You should hear, you should hear Samuel pray. Isn't it cute? Samuel, praise the Lord. Hey, uh. We teach our kids to be religious, don't we? I taught my boys. Casey, praise the Lord. Hannah doesn't do that. Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. That's it. And her whole prayer is about that. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. Not in what He gave me. I delight in your deliverance. There is no, ho- no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Wow. And then she goes on to give her own testimony. I was down, but He lifted me up. I was barren, but He gave me a child. He guards the feet of His saints. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. Just praising God and testifying of God's greatness. Nothing about herself. Nothing about her wonderful little boy. Just God, 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 God. That's all I can talk about. That's all I want to say. That's all I want to think. That's all that comes out of me. Godly women know how to praise God. And does that have an impact on those around you, living this kind of lifestyle? Yes, it does. Mothers, we appreciate you. We appreciate you. Live this kind of life before your children, before your grandchildren, before your friends. And it will have an everlasting impact on some of us. It's having an everlasting impact on me, and I appreciate you. God appreciates you. These principles, though, are not just for moms, not just for women. There are some principles here that us men can really learn from today. So, just in way of reviewing, godly women have real-life problems. You can't hide from them. They're going to come. When you face life's problems with passionate and persistent prayer, and God will meet your needs, you'll experience God's provision. I guarantee it. The Bible guarantees it. And godly women keep their vows, and godly women know how to praise God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. For your word. Thank you, Lord, for preserving and providing in your word this story of Hannah and her great prayer life and her great need and how you met it. Thank you, Lord, that we are able to see her response. She never lashed out at Penina, Lord. Instead of lashing out in pain at Penina, she took her pain to You. She did the right thing, Lord. Teach us to do the same. Lord, when she heard from the man of God, she took it as truth. She stood on that truth. You brought brightness back to her face, to her heart, and You met her needs, Lord. Thank You, Lord, that You taught us today that You will always meet our needs. Maybe the timing is not ours. It's not the, the thing we imagined when it would happen or how it would happen, but You will always provide for us as we are faithful to You, Lord. Father, thank You for reminding us that when we make a vow to You, we are expected to keep it. Hannah was faithful in keeping her vow, and she never regretted it. She never looked back. As a matter of fact, we just learned, Lord, that 
as she kept her vow, she was more able to praise you. Father, give us that same attitude, Lord. That when we live for you, when we keep our vows to you, it will bring a heart of praise and thankfulness. Let us be quick to praise you, Lord. Let us be faithful. Let us always look to you, Lord, in our troubles. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We ask that you change our lives. Don't let us go out of here the same today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.